Delmar Bautha. My pronouns are they and them. Um, I've been a birth worker in one capacity or another for 20 years. Um, I am a doula. I'm also a new community midwife um, in, in Pittsburgh, moving to Pittsburgh next month. Um, and I'm also a lactation specialist. Um, so I've been doing the work of supporting families and advocating families for 20 years now. Um, I've also been a home visitor um, or family coach with programs like Healthy Start and Happy Families. All right, so this is a presentation um, that I originally created for, um, for the training for the Certified Birth Justice Doula Program um, at Southern Birth Justice Network. Um, and we felt that this was a really important piece to add to the training because so many of the certifying organizations strictly believe that doulas are not advocates and should not be advocating for anything and that that's not their job. Um, and after a long time being a doula, I realized that that really only serves people who have a lot of privilege. Um, but people from oppressed communities are at a serious disadvantage if their doulas are not advocating for them. Um, so a doula is anybody who is representing another person's interests. Um, that does not, I'm sorry, did I say a doula is somebody who's representing another person's interest? That's true, but I meant an advocate. <laughs> um, and that is true whether you are a family member, whether you are a doula or um, a clinical care provider or somebody who just met somebody on the street and something's happening to them and you're speaking up for them. That is what an advocate does. So it's somebody who adds their voice in defense of someone else. But it can also look like you advocating for yourself. And in order to be a good advocate, I think that understanding Maslow's hierarchy of needs is really important. Um, because if we don't know what our clients need and they're not sure what they need, um, then it's really hard to do the work of an advocate. So Maslow's hierarchy for folks who've never seen it before um, is a way of understanding what we need and what needs are more important or more pressing than others. Like what needs are foundational and have to be there in other, for other needs to be considered. Um, and we're going to go through these um, one by one in consideration of birth in just a moment. So don't feel like you need to memorize that picture. All right, so the most foundational needs are like your basic needs for life, right? You need food, you need water, you need shelter, you need warmth or um, protection from the, from the climate, um, and you need to rest. If you don't have these things, then nothing else is important. These are your most basic needs. So when you think about the birth justice rights that Jamara just went over, um, denying people food and water while they are in labor already undermines all of their other needs. Our next step up on that hierarchy is the need for safety. Um, and this is another place where um, needs of birthing people get undermined all the time. People need to feel stability, security, they need predictability. Um, and this is definitely one of, those, one of those skills that I think are super important for a doula or someone else supporting birthing people to have is to be able to forecast what's happening next that gives people a sense of predictability and that promotes a sense of safety. Um, and also fear from, uh, sorry, freedom from fear and intimidation, whether that is real or perceived, um, has the same effect on, on your physiology and your psychology. So this is hard to come by in our modern birthing world, um, especially if you are birthing inside of a hospital. Um, but right now, during a pandemic, it's even harder to find because everything, everything that we read creates fear, right?
And then as we get up higher into, into that triangle, you can see how these things are hard to have. We don't have the, the bottom two layers to this, to this cake, we'll call it. So our next one is, is the need to feel like you belong and that you are loved. You need to have trust and acceptance, approval, um, and intimate relationships. And so these things can be greatly undermined if you don't have the first two. And that leads to self-esteem. Feeling like you have dignity, that you've mastered something, that you've accomplished something, and that you have the respect of others around you. So as you can see, as we get higher and higher on this, certainly oppressed people in birth often have difficulty getting to these levels because they've been undermined at the levels underneath here. And then we have self-actualization, where you feel like you've achieved your full potential. You did everything you could, right? We often tell uh, birthing people when things don't go right, well, you did everything you could. You tried everything you could. But oftentimes that's not, that's not really true because they were consistently undermined at those bottom layers. So that's, that is our hierarchy of needs. Um, it is also super important. I don't think this slide belongs here. I feel like this is out of place. Or it might be another refer slide later on. We'll see what happens. <laughs> um, it is super important that you be referring people out to other folks that you know that can help build up those needs and help them fill those needs because you cannot be the end all and the be all to everybody and to everything. And I think that we get into this more when we talk about self-care to PowerPoint presentations are mashing up in my head. <laughs> right, so here are some examples of places and services that you can refer clients to or friends to or family members to. Don't feel like you need to have like a title in front of your name or at the end of your name to be able to refer to these places. Most of these can be found with a Google search. So I'm gonna go ahead and read this for folks who are listening in on the phone um, or who don't have access to a screen reader that has that is compatible with uh, with these slides. So social services, specialists, alternative providers, childbirth classes, lactation specialists and consultants, therapists and counselors for mental health, support groups, bus passes, legal aid, car seats, other baby needs, shelters, domestic violence and interpersonal violence services, and abortion providers. All right, so how do we, how do, we do this work of advocacy with someone who is pregnant? Probably the most important thing, I often tell my clients, whether or not I make it to your birth matters way less than whether or not we have done this prenatal work together. If we do the prenatal work together, it creates a situation where the client is in a much better position to advocate for themselves and their partners are in a better position to advocate for them as well. That doesn't mean that doulas shouldn't be present at births. We can talk about that more later. So childbirth education, super important. Um, Lots of places are currently teaching them virtually. I know that I'm teaching both private classes and group classes almost every weekend right now, and I'm teaching them virtually. Um, most hospitals are teaching them virtually. I do not recommend taking a hospital class because they only teach you how to be a good and compliant patient and not how to advocate for yourself. So I highly recommend that you encourage folks to take childbirth education courses outside of the hospital. And if you are someone who is interested in doing childbirth education, probably the most important two books that I would recommend that you read are Teaching to Transgress by Bell Hooks and Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire. So childbirth education is super important because it minimizes fear and trauma. It lets you know your options. It tells you what you should expect. And all of that can help build up those foundational layers of 
of that hierarchy of needs that we just discussed. And it gives you a foundation for creating a birth plan. I know that there's lots of people who hate birth plans, but folks who are in the middle of contractions are not in a position to clearly discuss their wants and needs with a provider, especially when those providers like nurses are changing shifts every eight to 12 hours or when somebody goes to lunch or dinner. Okay. So writing a birth plan, the process of that should really include a clarification of what the pregnant person's values and goals are, because without that, it's really hard to make any kinds of decisions ahead of time. Um, like I said, it helps you clearly communicate with your partner. And if you're helping someone write a birth plan, you should encourage them to be flexible in situations where there is something unexpected, right? Let them know and really drive the point home that a birth plan is not a contract and that it is not a promise that this is how things are going to happen in your labor. Um, it really should include only the things that they find are super important for their well-being, either physiological or psychological. And here is an acronym that I like to teach my clients to use for informed decision making. This is not mine, but I don't remember where I learned it. Um, so if you know where this came from, please do let me know so I can give that person credit. Um, so the acronym is BRAIN. I tell them to use their brain when they need to make a decision. Um, and that means asking what the benefits and risks are for everything that's being offered. And if there are any alternatives, what those are, and what the risks and benefits are of those alternatives. Whether or not what's being offered to you is in line with your values and goals. And then, do we need to do this now? Can we wait? Do I have an hour? Do I have a week? Do I have a day? Why is this urgent? Why is it urgent? Or can we hold off on that decision? And also, no. That's another thing N stands for, um, is totally a valid choice. Nope, not doing it. And also, I'm not making this decision right now. Also a valid choice. All right, so this is another list of rights um, when it comes to birth. This is from the National Advocates for Pregnant Women. So you have the right to say no and to be heard, um, to labor in a way that works for you, to know all of your options, to have a support person, to change doctors, midwives, or nurses, to leave the hospital or birth center, or to ask people to leave your home if you're having a home birth, to not be touched, to birth vaginally, and to chest or breastfeed. All right, so beyond childbirth education, our job is really to support the autonomy of our clients or the person that we are supporting. What does that look like? And this has been um, adapted for birth from authors Desi and Ryan, um, who wrote the five components of autonomy support. This was originally written for mental health counselors. And I often say birth workers really like we should have minored in mental health. <laughs> All right, so number one, understanding and validation of the client's frame of reference or point of view. Super important. If we don't understand where our clients are coming from, and this goes back to the cu cultural congruence that Jamara was talking about, if we don't understand where our clients are coming from or what their point of view is, it is nearly impossible to advocate for what they want. Um, and it is super important that beyond understanding it, that we are validating their point of view. And that doesn't look like telling someone that they're right. It means telling somebody that it is understandable that they think or feel that way. It does look like unconditional support for that client's point of view and for what they want and for their values and goals. You are not interjecting your own stuff you're not judging what they want, you are unconditionally supporting it, even if it is different than what you would choose for yourself. 
can be a challenge for a lot of folks. I don't want to hear about what you would have done. That is not helpful. Um, number three is recognizing that there are choices and supporting the process of making their the client's process of making the choice. So for some people that looks like they are going to circle up and pray to Jesus and then make a decision that they feel is inspired or communicated to them from God. Cool. Even if that is not your own process, that is their process and that is valid for them. Um, it might look like using tarot cards to find your answer. Cool. And that is valid for them. Um, it might look like needing to spend the day researching on PubMed um, and reading all the journal articles that they can get their hands on and then making a decision. Or it might look like they cry about all of their options for the next 24 hours and then make a decision. All of those are valid. It could look really any kind of way. Um, and supporting the process of making the decision is just as important as supporting the end decision that they make. Number four is avoiding the exertion of control or pressure. Don't get frustrated with their process. Don't get frustrated because they decided something different. Don't get frustrated because you think that they are acting against their own best interest. That's not what you're there for. You've given them all the information or helped them gather that information and now you need to just support. This is not about you. And again, number five, we've kind of touched on that like eight times. Make sure that they are understanding the risks and the benefits of all of the available options. Oftentimes, especially when I am um, supporting somebody at a hospital birth, I find that this is probably the biggest part of my job is modeling respect showing the care providers in the hospital how to treat my client with respect and dignity. And teaching them to have power with my client instead of power over my client. And that is a tall task, right? Um, the hospital is set up for efficiency and oftentimes having power with is not a real efficient process. As we just saw, in the five steps of supporting people's right to autonomy. It can be slow, it can be arduous, you cannot hurry people through their process. Um, and so the hospital often moves into power over um, to keep their process efficient. And there is a whole human being going through a physiological and emotional process who cannot be hurried. Power over doesn't work. So when a care provider comes into the room, introduce yourself, introduce your client, share pronouns if the client wants you to, that's important. Some clients don't want you to share a pronoun, that's okay. Um, and ask the care provider who they are, what their role is. Um, oftentimes care providers will walk into the room and start doing things to people or doing things they think for people um, without even saying what their name is or what they came to do. So slow down that process by forcing them to talk with your client. Weird. <laughs> um, doulas, I encourage them to offer to help. Ask where supplies are kept, checks, pads, gloves, um, tissues, things that you can get the client so that you don't have to call the nurse all the time into the room. The nurses oftentimes, if you call them into the room, they feel like they have to do something to the patient to justify being in the room. Um, so if you can get the checks pads um, and you can get the gloves and you can change change the sheets if they get dirty or get um, an extra blanket for the client, then that is less time that the nurse needs to spend doing unnecessary things to your client to justify having gotten a warm blanket. Use the word team when you're talking to care providers. Let them know that all of you are in this together. That is what power with looks like. Um, it really helps them be more open to when you need to step in and act as an advocate 
So all of these things are obviously part of advocating for our clients or for our loved ones who are in labor or for ourselves. Um, but people think of advocacy as just like the end step, which we're going to get to, I promise. Um, like stepping in when something is going wrong. But all of these pre-steps are part of that advocacy work. All right, so this is the big one for me um, that I kind of do all of the time. Restate your provider's words in a more respectful and compassionate way that gives the power back to the client. So if the nurse comes in and says, your doctor's coming and he's gonna break your water, you turn to your client and say, it sounds like your doctor's gonna come in and check you and then wants to break your water. Is that something that you'd like to do? I spend a lot of time at births playing really dumb, which if you know me personally, you know that that's really hard for me. <laughs> um, I take the role of somebody who knows nothing and I'm really curious and I ask a lot of questions and not for my own sake, because usually I know the answer of what I'm asking, but for the client's sake, right? How are you gonna break her water? Hmm, I've never seen that. Why would we break somebody's water? What are we doing that for? And ask the client, get curious um, about what the client wants, even if you already know the answer. So then you're asking the client for the benefit of the provider hearing the answer. What do you wanna do? Is that okay with you? All right, so this is, this is the nitty gritty where people think that this is what advocacy is. So hopefully if you've done all of the other things and, and the care providers are humane providers, you're never getting to this part. Um, but they are skills that you should have because even, even with providers that I thought that I really, really loved, I've had to use these skills. is always heartbreaking when a provider that you've referred someone to ends up uh, putting them in a position of oppression and violence and you need to step in between them. So sometimes it looks like physically stepping in between them. If you do that, you should be prepared to have security called on you. Um, but sometimes it's just like psychically stepping in between them uh, with your words um, and by, by returning that power to your client. But when a provider acts without consent, they have stolen that power from the client. And it is the advocate's job to take it back and give it back to your client. So if you are self-advocating, that means taking it back for yourself. If you're advocating for someone else, it means taking it back and giving it back to that person. So here we make reference to the doula. Like I said, this was originally for a doula training. It is entirely your job as a doula or as an advocate in that room to remind everyone in the room that there is a whole entire person in that body who has the right to give or refuse consent. And it is amazing how frequently this gets forgotten. Um, especially if you are in a hospital setting, I would actually encourage, you know those whiteboards they've got in the hospital where they have you put like the client, the, where they have you put that's not true, where the nurse will write her name or their name and they'll write the client's name and their support person's name and then they'll fill in the goal, um, healthy mom and healthy baby, and they do this like on every board without actually asking the client what, what their goals are. Um, interrupt them right from that very get-go and say, you know, actually my client's goal is to have informed decision making and to have the right to bodily autonomy respected through this process. Like actually put it up on the board. I don't know if any other, anybody else actually ever looks at that board, but at least you've told that nurse what your client's goal is there. All right, I love acronyms. My acronym for consent is FRIES. I also did not invent this. While I love them, I'm really bad at coming up with them. Um, so if you know who came up with fries for consent, uh, please do let me know so that I can give them credit. Um, consent is freely given, reversible, 
informed, essential, and specific. So if they are being coerced, if somebody comes into the, into the room and says, well, if I don't break your water, your baby's going to die. First of all, give me a break. <laughs> um, but also, um, that's coercion. That is, not, that is not consent that is freely given. Anything that your client says, whether it's yes or no after that, that was not freely given consent. Um, it is reversible. Yeah, I said you could break my water, but you've been digging in my vagina for the last five minutes and haven't managed to do it. I don't want you to do this anymore. Get out. It is informed. Again, doctor come in, comes in and says, if I don't break your water, your baby is going to die. Um, that is not informed. What, are, what exactly are the risks of not breaking my waters and what are the risks of you doing it? Why do you want to do it? What are the benefits? You want to go back to using your brain there. Essential, if you don't have my consent, then you're not doing it. It is a vital step in the process of doing anything to my body. And then it's specific. Yes, I did tell you that you could break my water, but I didn't say that then you could massage my uterus to squeeze all, of, all the water out of my uterus afterwards. Or yes, I did say that you could do a vaginal exam, but I didn't say that you could do a rectal exam. All right, consent cannot be assumed or pressured or reluctant if the client's like, well, I mean, I guess that if you absolutely have to, you could maybe do a vaginal exam, just be really quick about it. Um, that, that's not really consent. Um, and it is definitely not ambiguous. You wanna be, again, specific about what you're getting consent to do or what the provider is getting consent to do. So being an advocate looks like being the voice, um, telling the provider that the client has not given consent. And these are steps for interrupting violence. Should probably be a slide for what um, So being, being an advocate looks like being the voice and telling the provider that the client has not given consent. Remind everyone present in the room that the client's well-being is at stake. My client hasn't agreed to this yet. Let's take a minute so that everybody can get on the same page. And that last part was being the wedge. Ask the provider to stop so that everybody can get on the same page. Who wrote this slide? It sounds exactly like my voice. <laughs> And then be the call. This is actually, after the first two steps, um, this is what I have actually found to be the most effective. When you ask the other professional in the room to bear witness and to be a wedge with you, right? So what it looks like in a hospital birth is telling the nurse, hey, while you're taking notes over there, please write down that my client has not consented to the procedure the doctor is continuing with. Can we, can we take a minute here so that we can all get on the same page and get consent first? That, I found, that sentence right there, I have found the most effective to a doctor going like this immediately. Um, and unfortunately, I also have in here a birth assistant because I've also been in positions where I've had to ask the assistant to write down in their notes that the midwife is continuing with the procedure without the client's consent. That slows people down in their tracks really fast. Um, and you really can't do any of those things without following it up with being the bridge and facilitating a conversation because now the doctor thinks, okay, now my job is to convince the client that I need to have consent instead of we need to have a conversation so that if this is actually really necessary, the client can consent, right? So you want to be able to facilitate that conversation, ask questions, gather options, um, preview or forecast for the client what to expect during that procedure. Um, and a, encourage affirming touch. 
Um, if the client is being validated, putting your hand on the client, some place where they have consented to you touching them and just having that firm touch um, kind of has a grounding effect on people so that they're no longer in this panicky space and can come back down and make a good decision for themselves. And then the biggest part of that is ask for consent. If the, if the provider cannot manage to get the words out of their mouth to ask for consent, then you do it. Um, and sometimes there's just situations where something has to be done for the sake of the life of the client or the baby and it can't, it can't be stopped. It's an emergency situation, right? Um, so this could be something like there's a shoulder dystocia and the provider needs to put both of their hands into a vagina to unwedge a shoulder um, and the client is freaking out and not in a psychological space to make that decision or to give consent. Um, so then your job becomes trauma prevention. So stay calm, take charge, let the client know, I'm right here with you. I hear you, I know you don't want this to happen. Um, this is not the time to rationalize though. Like, don't be like, this has to happen. And here are all the reasons why it has to happen. That is not the time for that. That's a conversation to have a little bit later. I know this is not what you wanted. Validate that for the client. That is real. And they need to know that someone in the room knows that. Let's get through this together. What's gonna happen next, you're gonna feel a lot of pressure. And then, and then the, the doctor is gonna ask you to, I don't know, X, Y, and Z, whatever the doctor's gonna ask you to do. And the nurse is gonna make a fist and put it right over your pubic bone and press down to get the baby's shoulder unstuck, okay? So we're just gonna keep breathing through it. I know it's super uncomfortable and not what you wanted, right? So here we're previewing what is happening. We are validating the client's experiences and that alone can go a very long way to preventing trauma from something that they didn't want to happen to their bodies or to their babies. Um, and this definitely takes some, some knowledge. So if you've never been to a birth, taking a childbirth class yourself, um, educating yourself about what to expect, um, and learning what happens in the management of emergencies. Um, probably my favorite book for that would be um, a book from the BEST course, Birth Emergency Skills Training, um, can let you know what to expect when an emergency is going down so that you can forecast that for your client. And of course, there's always, there's always an aftermath, whether you successfully interrupted a moment of violence against your client um, or not, there is always an aftermath and you should take your cues from the client um, because all of the consequences are theirs. And retribution for non-compliance is real with providers. I right? um, to tell you a short story, um, I had a client once um, who was the wife of a friend, so somebody I knew personally, not just professionally, um, and she was freaking out during her labor. She was like five centimeters and like thrashing in bed, and the nurse was really insistent that she needed to stay in the bed because her water was broken. That's not, if you're not familiar with birth, that's not a real legitimate reason to force somebody to stay in bed. Um, it was just the hospital's policies. Um, and so we were trying to calm her down and then the doctor came in to check her in the middle of all of that. So she was definitely not in a place to consent. Um, I asked the doctor if he could come back later and instead he said, if you don't calm down now, I'm going to kick your husband and your little doula out of the room um, and you're going to have to do this all by yourself, cupcake. He called her a cupcake. Um, and then later on, uh, when she was pushing and she was doing a great job, he held up the scissors and waved them at me and said, this one's for you, little Dooley. And he cut the worst episiotomy I have ever seen. So, super important to take your cues from the client. Let your client know prenatally 
that these are possibilities that could happen and find out what it is that they want you to do in those circumstances. Some clients do not want you to be an advocate. They want you to be quiet and be compliant and help them be compliant with what their providers are saying so that they don't have to deal with retributions from their, from their providers. Um, and others want to know that their provider is somebody who does these kinds of things and wants to change practices, right? So you have to have these conversations prenatally with your client. And afterwards, definitely don't assume their story. Don't mess with their memories. This, this birth might have been super traumatic for you, but they might think that everything was amazing and that they had a great birth. Um, I, I had a client who refused in the hospital, refused the, the usual um, Pitocin after the placenta comes out. At the hospital, they run Pitocin in everybody's IV after the placenta is out. Um, and she didn't want that, um, mostly because of the research that any amount of Pitocin perinatally can increase your chances of postpartum depression. And she already had a history of postpartum de of depression and she was really worried about postpartum depression. Um, and so the doctor fought her back and forth and back and forth, but in the end agreed to not doing Pitocin. Um, and then right after the placenta came out, the doctor freaked out, like completely panicked um, and started very aggressively doing fundal massage, moved to bimanual compression where they put a fist into the uterus and massage one hand on the outside, one hand on the inside. Um, and then she called for a different medication for Cytotec to manage bleeding that she gave her Cytotec rectally. And then she said, you're bleeding too much. We need we need to give you Pitocin. So my client consented to opening up the Pitocin IV. Um, and then when the nurse asked what the estimated blood loss had been, um, the doctor answered 225, which is not a hemorrhage, is not an emergency. Um, it's half of what's considered a hemorrhage in a home birth. But my client thought that her doctor was amazing and that her doctor saved her life. I'm not gonna tell her otherwise. Maybe four years from now, she'll call me because she'll find out something else and be like, can we talk about what such and such doctor did? Do you think that was necessary? And then I'll tell her what I think. But at our six week postpartum visit, I'm not getting into your doctor was a jerk and completely panicked and did a whole lot of unnecessary things to your body, right? Postpartum people are really psychically open at the risk of sounding really woo-woo. They're really psychically open. They're really vulnerable. Um, and you don't need to be messing with their memories. However, if they do have negative feelings about their birth, certainly validate those feelings. Even if you think, no, your doctor really did save your life. All those things your doctor did to you were absolutely necessary. Um, and, your, and your client feels that they were not, um, validate those feelings. Those feelings are real. Remember that threats, whether real or perceived, have the same effect on your brain and your body. Um, and then refer them to counseling because most of us are not therapists. And then what about you? This, this work requires a lot of what about you? because it, it puts you on the line all the time. 